Abwashtet, Tanse, Oki, Bonjour, Guanu Day, welcome. Intersections of Gender Research Signature Area warmly welcomes you uh, to our session, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, a Calls for Justice, Indigenous Women on Rising Up. In the Louise are Rebecca Sock Beeson. My name is Rebecca Sock Beeson. And Jay Awug, Abanawobskig in Maine, the United States. I belong to the Penobscot Nation, where the white water flows over the rocks. I am also a community member of the Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation here in Treaty 6 territory. And I'm also a recently band member of my late grandmother's territory, Tobik First Nations in New Brunswick. I'm a faculty member in the first in the Indigenous Peoples Education graduate specialization in the Faculty of Education. And I also serve as the Associate Director of, of Intersections of Gender Research Signature Area here at the University of Alberta. I'm the organizer of the session, which includes 12 Indigenous women activists, scholars, and artists. So the next two hours will address findings of the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls entitled Reclaiming Power in Place, where we will share both thinking and creative expressions of impact from the report and issues surrounding MMIWG with the objective of raising awareness on these issues. I wanna point out as Indigenous women sharing in the next two hours, each of us is a murdered missing Indigenous people's family member. And generally, most all Indigenous women I know have had someone they are related to or a loved one who has gone missing. So we will start off the program honoring the ancestral traditions of this territory of Treaty 6 and Métis lands with Elder Ekde Cardinal, who was raised traditionally in a Northern Plains Cree environment. She will offer the prayer for us um, and she's originally from Saddle Lake First Nations in Northwestern Alberta. She's hosted women's gatherings for the last 30 years. And for 22 years, she served as a native cultural arts teacher at Northern Lakes College. Fawn Wood will then go and sing a, um, a very infamous round dance song um, in honor. Uh, it's entitled, Remember Me. Fawn was born into the respected multi-generational traditional singing Wood family. And her singing reflects her Cree, both her Cree and Salish tribal lineage. At an early age, Fawn would sing her heart out at powwows alongside her mother and father. And in 2006, she was the first female to win the hand drum contest at the Gathering of Nations powwow, into powwow uh, which is one of the largest gatherings of indigenous peoples in North America. In 2009, she opened the show at the 11th annual Native American Music Awards. And in 2010, she also sang with her partner Dallas for the opening of the Aboriginal People's Choice Music Awards in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So please join us as we take this time to honor missing and murdered Indigenous peoples and families. And as elder scholar Eber Hampton points out, no matter who you are or where you come from, we all, we all have ancestors. We all have ancestors that prayed for us, are the us being their descendants, they prayed for our well being. How? Kitty Mamu Tao, you know. Sawaim Tan, Sawaim Nan, Umutan, Oska Mamu Paya Utum Kakio, Kape Chitus Kapora Quest Kamskama, Kisigawanots Nanaskumun, Yiko Muasek, Kisigawanots. I went to Ewa no te bixwa tenoma um aya skoko kanamate tsik ka upmeg etu taichik eno te etoyan akika kisimuk aimehag kamska tanskanma espeg kape katuskatama ega Apu me kanto kam kamska matan suma tani kuma kita kamga da sewem nan no tawi mau kamiuma kamiunak skama kapci tayan inisun kasuwe tuskia kamska matan iku Kawitse hajaki kangek. Kahkio kiano katuskia. Kawitse hitoja. 
kantonama hanma. Egaums aiwa kespa ikuma. Aiman wawi sanhe kawa kuma tsek skwewa skwesa. Mikskeite nigo. Ja ja. E hanma e guanma. Atusketan. Don't. Antonamuk, tani kum espaik. Uitsi totan. Tantse umake tutama. Eka aiwak ekskan espaik. Nanaskamon nuhtauinan. Iko emia nisiwen kiwa kapsihtaik. Mikä tuskeuen? Kamskama tanssi. Koiras kattus kepa ikuma. Eikä minusta ei minä nanaskumun, mihin se uiskista vaan en tuona meidän kanssa koiras kannakskama homma. Iko ja haima. Mutta skoa on kaikki on muuta kuin tuota, joka minä nakskama ei. Saa kihtuin, uit sihtuin. Ja kun hän jää se kistava matsuun. Ja nasku mun uutta homma kahkia on kapitu teikä. Kä miutu uut teik teikä kauikki kistava. Mistä ei tee saa kihtuen, voi tihtuen. Miu näksvauen. Aika meimuk. Pukohta katapoja, kamskama tansomea. Aja. Koeski tuttama. Kan tuhtama tan suma, ke tuhtama kaki au kiano. Kami au sawaima no tawinan. Umutanas kami ya, niku amia se kise kau. Ewa, kami naks kama ai hai. Nanas kumun. Kahki on uhteen ja piik, ka viitsi taas soik. Katsos kata mahuma. Ka mia saa kihtuun. Na nasku muun, kan tuhtama. Ka nana ihtama. Haka meimuk, kaipuu meik. Kamskaan. Kaipuu meik. Kam yhtä puhta anavaa. Eikö se aihe naskumon? Aihe.
hi, hi, Shnish, Ekade, Elder Cardinal, and Fawnwood for getting us started right. The opening remarks will be delivered by the commissioner, Michelle Odette of the Innu Nation. She's a mother of five and study visual arts at the Université de Québec à Montreal, and then arts education at Concordia University. Michelle has dedicated herself personally and professionally to improving the lives of Indigenous women in Canada. Serving first as president of Quebec Native Women and Native Women's Association of Canada, NWAC. She furthermore served as associate deputy minister for Quebec's Ministry of Relations with Citizens and Immigration, where she was responsible for the Secretariat for Women between 2004 and 8. In 2017, she was appointed as one of the commissioners for the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. She received an honorary doctorate from the University of Montreal for her political and social engagement with defending the rights of Indigenous women in 2018. Since the fall of 2019, she has been Senior Advisor on Reconciliation and Indigenous Education at Laval University. Bonjour, Kwe. Je vous regarde de nord, qu'est-ce que vous Bonjour, Martha. Long time no see. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's other people that I, I don't see with this technology, but believe me, if we were in the room before doing this opening remark or this conversation with you, I would get so many hugs, so many hugs from women, from sisters, from people across this turtle island, because today is very tough but we have to be strong. We have to be resilient or we have to be how we feel. And I am right now in the uh, territory of the Atikamek Nation and of course, the beautiful Abenaki Nation where we call Three Rivers, Trois Rivières. And as we speak and we uh, share this moment uh, with you, not far from me, there is the family of Joyce Echaquan uh, who, every day go to that court, to the uh, coroner inquiry to understand what happened that day on September 28. Why our, um, their wife, mother, sister, and daughter left in those cir circumstance. So I'm walking behind or beside them every day since that tragic moment. And I do this as, as a mom, as a woman, so this is where we are today, but also knowing that we have 215, maybe more kids. We found their uh, little bones uh, and we heard that today on the news. It did shake me again because stories like this, I think we will hear more and more. So I would need so much hugs and so much love from you so we can continue what people started way before me and way before us. I wanna acknowledge also our ancestor, our leaders and our people that made sure that we do what we do today. So I receive a gift and one day I will pass that gift, I hope, either to my one of my five children or my two beautiful granddaughter. One is in Chilliwack, and the other one is coming this weekend to give me love, of course. It is, it is almost two years uh, when we gather in Ottawa on June 3rd, and it's gonna be next week. And for me, that two years after presenting the report, I feel like it was, it was the day when we started the inquiry. And when we started the inquiry, it's because of the strength. It's because of the mobilization. It's because of the passion or the anger, or I don't know what the family felt that day or that moment when they started to tell the truth and raise their voice and walk on the street or knock on those doors that I would say the provincial government or territorial or the federal government, our own indigenous communities or leadership to say, we wanna know what happened to our loved one. 
we want to understand what happened to them. We want to know why there is a reaction for the non-Native people. We used to say white uh, those days, but not to our sister, mom, or loved one. So we have to remember that if we had a national inquiry, it's not because for a few years, some of us yeah, ask or demand it or push for it. It's because many, many, many families, many survivors started that portage. And I wanna say thank you. I know it's tough and you're right when you mentioned that every one of us, we know somebody in our own respective family that left this world or it's not, uh, they never came back uh, still. So yes, my little cousin or my friend or you know my neighbor and we're all interconnected. So we are affected when we hear news like this morning or when we walk beside Joyce, husband, kids and family. And we know that it's not only them but it's the entire nation across Canada that it's affect, affected by that. So I wanna make sure that it, and I'm a little bit rusted in English. Huh? It's so French where I live in Quebec City. So uh, I'll do my best, but I know you will understand my Francophone English or whatever, but at least it comes from the heart. When a person speak the truth, for me, it's a story, it's a truth. And then that story become so powerful that it will create that wave that we needed to have in 2017, when the government finally uh, agree or accept or had no choice, it's the depend how we wanna see it to put in place that national inquiry. The time wasn't big enough or we didn't have enough time to do all the work that we wanted to do. First of all, I was surrounded by uh, lawyers, all my commissioners, friends, they all went to that world. The, we call it Kaimet, for those who speak. And for me, I never finished uh, university, but I knew I was surrounded by amazing warriors, family members, or people around me to say, we will walk with you, Michel, and make sure that we, we will build this national inquiry not perfect, but we will do our best. And the most powerful thing that happened to me was that when we are surrounded, surrounded by the expertise, the passionate or the people with the lived experience, nothing can scare me. Nothing can stop me because I was a tool for them. I was something that would bring their tears, angers, or hope in a report. Huh? And that was the toughest part for me when you receive all the truth across Canada, you, we, we, we touch every territory as much as we could. I ask every staff everywhere we went, come with me after the inquiry or come before the week of the inquiry. Let's go meet the people in downtown East Side or um, um, Winnipeg uh, North, or Montreal uh, Square Cabot or in that community. Let's do a ceremony with the people of that land. Let's live their protocols. So when we do the work that we were asked to do, our five cents that the creator gave us will be sensitive, will receive the, 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 the taste, what we see, what we hear and what we touch and what we feel. Because you, you will go back probably to your department because you relent to us. You agree to walk, walk with us a couple of months. Or some of you will go back to your former job that you had. Or some of us will try to find another job. But the family members, their struggle, their fight, and their anger to find the truth will be there until the last, their last breath. So we did as much as we could to walk beside but the toughest part also, there's so many, but tough with a smile, of course, and with lots of love, was that we heard more than, or close to 10,000 recommendation. 10,000, 2,300 and plus people came 
have the courage to tell their stories. Some of the family, it's not only one family member that disappeared or got killed, maybe some of them was seven loved ones that never came back home, seven in the same family. And knowing that the same pattern was for me shocking, the, the colonial violence, the residential school, the lack of, uh, we were removed from our territory, knowledge, culture, and it's, uh, make us so, so, so vulnerable. And it was like, oh, from that, how do we bring your tears, your anger, your, your vision and those recommendations because we were ordered to uh, examine all these systemic causes in few months. We were ordered to examine all the systemic causes in each government across Canada not only the federal agency, but every province and territories. Then I found out on the spot, this is my naive side. I said, honey, we're, moved to, we're moving to Winnipeg or Ottawa because we will work, work on that national inquiry, but no, we had to build everything. So for me, it was important that I built this with the family members and the expert from the communities and uh, our organization across Canada. And from that, we realized that oh, there are so many causes that we have to examine to study and then bring some recommendation. So we will have to prioritize. That was breaking my heart. But with some of this, this, the, 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 the circle that I surrounded myself and of course the other commissioner, we, we decided to examine places such as the justice system, the safety, which mean the, the, the policing, uh, the, the, the good or the bad relationship or the unexisting relationship with the police and youth protection. And this is why when we finally brought all those words, we always thought that we have to put the witness in the center. When we talk about the, uh, the right for justice, the right for health, the right for culture, the right for uh, safety or public security, or just the right to be a human being and with dignity, we always wanted to put their testimony at the center and then bring those facts and then bring those evidence and say, here, Canada, you gave us that duty. You gave us few months to do something when we know that the causes started way before Canada was called Canada. It started when the first contact uh, arrived. We were so welcoming. We said, Quebec, Quebec, when we saw you coming, which means get up from your boat. And it's my city <laughs> or my region in Inu. But no, uh, suddenly they decided that they were the first one who found this place and all the way they created those legislation totally pushed us as guardians or keeper, keepers or protector of this amazing, beautiful land. But it had also an, an impact and still today on my daughters, the women, the girls, and I have to be honest also to our men and boys. So the colonialism is still impacting us today. So with that, to be able to say on June 3rd, two years ago, here, we're not talking about genocide, a cultural genocide. The families, the women, the men that spoke to us are saying it's way more than a cultural genocide. It's a genocide. And here, the proof and the fact. But because women put that on the agenda, Many, many of some groups across Canada wanted to discredit or shake their voices. But today they have a powerful tool that says 250 plus call for justice. It's not recommendation today, it's call for justice. It's legal imperative. We had so many legal lands, international, Canadian, or indigenous, more important to say, hey, you cannot pretend that it doesn't happen uh, or it's just an isolated uh, situation over, over those decades and blah, 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 but it's everywhere. 
in the north, in the south, doesn't matter where we live, and your country, this institution or all those institutions is very responsible of the, the loss of the loved one. So the women gave us the opportunity in that report to say, here's some solution. Uh, we're not just mad. Yes, we have all the rights to be mad, but we have the rights also to be powerful, beautiful, resilient, and say, we know the problem, but we know the solution. And when I see the women walking and dancing or singing or beating or just be there, and we think they're silent sometimes, no, they're not. Their presence is so powerful. So I have to say thank you to all of them that gave us that opportunity, that gift, a journey that I don't think I'll be able to live again, but until my last breath, it is something that I will carry every day every day with lots of love. So I hope for those who listen, you feel that it's not only a chapter in the history of indigenous women, but it's your responsibility, like it is my responsibility. Merci. Wow, merci, merci. Uh, many thanks, commissioner. Um, your energy is just mobilizing and inspiring, and I can see very easily why you are leading, uh, why you're, why you're, you know, leading us in these in this endeavor. So you know, it's you're absolutely right. It has, um, and I hope you think that what we've taken up here today, um, you know, uh, encapsulates those efforts to name it as a genocide, uh, because indeed it transcends a cultural genocide. Um, and so I, I think we have uh, been very careful about um, you know, unpacking that um, and confirming it and supporting mm -hmm. it. So, you know, thank you for all that you do to support the social and political change of our people, of the women, and also Canadian society. This is a tremendous effort. Um, and when you speak about thousand, over a thousand, um, that is, um, magnitude of that is incomprehensible. And so, and you're one of the leaders of that. And I just, um, I thank you from my heart and my soul for all that you do um, to work in this effort. So, mm. yes. and I wish you the very best and that you stay well um, during the pandemic and we need you to stay well. <laughs> so from there, I'm, I'm just going to shift and draw your attention to our panel session and invite you to get engage. And as Dr. Verna St. Dennis encourages us when approaching um, the difficult knowledge, um, she encourages us to approach through an anti-racist lens, uh, which is to open our hearts and thicken our skins. And we begin our keynote panelists with um, one of my first, you know, one of my first activist mentors actually. And as a young woman, um, I met her, um, Winona LaDuc. And she really, um, she had a tremendous impact on my life and continues to inspire and motivate um, countless indigenous women and peoples um, and society at large, I would say. Winona LaDuc um, is an internationally renowned activist. She's serving as our keynote panelist. And uh, she works on issues of sustainable development, renewable energy and food systems. She lives and works on the White Earth Reservation in Northern Minnesota and is a two-time vice president candidate with Ralph Nader for the Green Party. She's widely recognized for her work on environmental and human rights issues. As a graduate of both Harvard and Antioch universities, she's written extensively on Native American environmental issues. And she's the author of five books, including Recovering the Sacred, All Our Relations, and a novel, Last Standing Woman. So with that, I open up the panel uh, and invite you to engage in, uh, with an open heart and, and thick skin. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of visiting with you today and talking to you about the issues of missing and murdered women and also the, op uh, the, the issues of how we're all gonna survive because they're all closely related. I'm um, grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you. I wanna share with you some slides and a little of our thinking you know, from Oma a King down in our territory. And um, what I wanna say is, is that, um, you know, for a long time, our women have been missing and murdered. And I, you know, every family almost has one of these stories, 
You know, I myself have a similar story of one of my cousins who show up in the Mississippi River a long time ago, you know, and nobody knows her too. But now these times are changing. And so this is a picture of a woman, Indian woman, a water protector, and she's in downtown Duluth, city that has had a lot of missing and murdered women, but you know, she is not missing or murdered and she is alive and she's about 20 feet wide and 30 feet tall downtown on 2nd Street and 2nd Avenue. And that is this new time where we are, we are going to tell our story. As, I, as we uh, tell that, I want to uh, talk about the history of this because this is a long history because indigenous people are in the way of extraction from Wendigo economics. Probably a term you all haven't heard or used much, but an economy that destroys its mother, an economy that takes more than it needs and cannot stop its consumption is in fact a cannibal economy. That's what this is. That's what y'all got going in Canada. That's what they got going in the States. The history of the impact on indigenous peoples is long and women. But just to say that the Osage nation in Oklahoma, you know, those people had oil at one point. They still got oil over there. But, you know, um, there were uh, between 19, 1901, there was 930 oil wells. And by, um, a little bit later, they were producing 319 million barrels of oil a year out of the Osage Nation. Now, this picture I'm showing you is from some of the people who were murdered because Indian people, particularly Indian women, were murdered for head rights. Between it's called head rights, oil rights. Between 1921 and 1926, there were 60 uh, Native people murdered, at least in the Osage murders, kind of depicted in the Killers of the Flower Moon book. But you know, these are some of the people. This is kind of the impact of energy extraction on indigenous peoples early on. And that story continues. This is my sister, Ingrid Washington Waltaka Elisa. She was murdered February 25th, 1999 um, in Ua territory in Colombia. Um, and she was murdered, same thing, you know, extracting from pe indigenous peoples. And she was down there as a human rights worker, really looking at education systems of youth. But you know, she too became a victim of collateral damage, you know, of, of these wars and, and the impact of multinational corporations. And perhaps the story of the number of land defenders who have been killed or assassinated each, each month, there are more that are assassinated, many of them indigenous land defenders and many of them defending their lands from Canadian multinational corporations, Canadian mining corporations. This is Berta Ciceris. Uh, she, she died very young a day short of her birthday. She, she was born in 1971 and she died in 2016. So a day short of like her 25th birthday and um, uh, her 35th birthday, excuse me. But you know, she was murdered uh, by the Honduran military or Honduran forces associated with the dam project that they're trying to put up to uh, steal indigenous lands in Honduras. So a little bit of a context, what I'm talking about here has to do with women who stand up. Here's our sister from, from all east standing up in Mi'kmaq territory to the police, the courageous native women, this is a native woman at Standing Rock. You know, what I'm saying is that we are courageous because, you know, this is our water, this is our lives and, and selling out ain't gonna help our future generations. And so you find a lot of strong native women that are up at the front. Now I'm showing you this picture because this is a pipeline picture. This is a DAPL pipeline, Dakota Access Pipeline Battle, 6, 2016. You know, five short years ago, five short years ago, and this is the Enbridge Corporation's work, third largest corporation in Canada. They finance this. They finance this militarization, you know, $38 million worth of militarization. Um, they ended up, you know, in the middle of this, and we hold them responsible for the 800 people arrested and the, and the hundreds of people injured. That's the Enbridge Corporation, and this is Minnesota. This is what the frontline resistance looks like in Minnesota. Three years ago at the... Uh, uh, at the Enbridge facility in Clearbrook, Minnesota. Um, you know, they have strong opposition here. Our story is long and tragic. You know, it is long and tragic. Um, this is some art by John Pepion, um, attributed to the times in the back and oil fields, um, you know, for fracking. And um, fracking also, you know, indigenous, indigenous land. Indigenous people are the places where the oil is extracted and indigenous people are in the way of the pipelines. And so the rates of, uh, you know, this is another picture of a, a native woman in a man camp, you know, the kind of statistics that we know. And this is the opposition to the TC Energies project, you know, um, because we don't want human trafficking. 
and that comes from Canadian Pipeline Corporation. You know, we do not we do not support Canadian Pipeline Corporations here. And uh, you know, here's just a little bit of a, of a moment of the back in oil fields and the and the rise of sex trafficking that was prosecuted. You know, as a result of fracking. You know, in the back in oil fields, and a lot of this has to do with you know missing and murdered women, and a lot of it has to do with sex trafficking. You know that that has permeated uh, the oil industry and the oil pipeline industry. So you know the story is long, and the story is tragic, and it didn't just start now. Um, and at the same time, you know what I have to say to you is is that the way to stop these things is to stop the pipelines. You know, I could talk to you about how Enbridge now has a sex trafficking workshop and education program, but that, but like how more specific do you need to get than I'm gonna shove a pipeline down your throat? How more phallic do you need to get? Can you just explain that to me? You know, and we're gonna say it's consent and we're gonna spend a hundred million dollars over here and we're gonna trot out some Indians over here. We're gonna have some Indians pray for us. We're gonna have our pipelines blessed by some Indians in Canada. You know what, it's still, it's still egregious. It's still, you know, what it's like sitting there when Enbridge comes in and drills on your land or when it comes in and takes apart your forest. This is what it's like. You know, I'm standing there and I'm looking at this equipment coming towards me. The first thing is a feller buncher comes in there and it cuts, grabs a tree like this and cuts it off halfway up and throws it to the side. And then they get the next part of the tree and they cut it up like this and they throw it to the side and they keep coming towards you until they have taken down a swath of forest. And when they get through that, then they come for the women. That's what it's like. It feels like rape to be up here facing these Canadian corporations. And you know what? We're gonna face y'all. You know, over these last years, we have seen the rise of the resistance movements across the world. And we have seen the rise in the United States of many of these resistance movements. Sadly, sadly, many of those resistance movements and, and the social movement surged from the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, just, just right down the road from you here, you know? And what happened in that? All these years, all these years, we challenged the paradigms of white racism and white privilege and settler colonialism, which have named and renamed and put up statues and what is happening. In my life, I never thought I would see so many Columbus statues fall, so many statues of conquistadors fall or so many statues of Confederate soldiers fall. In my not life, I never thought I would see all of them, but I have seen them, them fall and I'm seeing instead the rise of indigenous women into political leadership across this country. And this is what that looks like. This is Deb Haaland, the US Secretary of Interior. It's the first time a native person has been appointed to such an office in the United States. And you know, that, that is what you need in Canada too. You need to not only appoint native people to these positions, but you need to change the paradigm from which they are forced to operate. Because if all Deb Holland can do is manage dysfunctional DIA or BIA policies, native people are not gonna be any better off. But the leadership, the leadership that is emerging from new elections and from the surge of our communities to grow and grow, not only our resistance, but our visions of what the future is gonna look like is only increasing, it's only increasing in time. This was the 2016 election. This is who we elected in the United States. I don't know what it looks like in Canada, but what I know is that more women of color are being elected across the board. And in 2018, that number surged even more. That doesn't change everything, but someone need to stand up to the regulatory authorities that are that are vastly under, under you know, they don't do their job. And in fact, their job is, is really misaligned. I mean, why would you talk about mitigation when you could just talk about protecting your water? Why is it that indigenous women are faced with these giant pipeline projects and we don't even have potable water in our villages? Why is that? What kind of justice is that Canada? What kind of justice is that the United States where what we are offered in all of these old pipeline projects, really a paradigm for the last century of colonialism. This is what resistance looks like on the front lines in Minnesota. Women, women in leadership today, opposing the pipeline projects, you know. Here's some of our sisters, our, our, our sister here, LaDonna has passed on, but the rest of these sisters are here and they are here standing on the front lines, opposing, opposing the Enbridge pipelines as they try to come into our territories. 
you know, $9 billion project that's never going to be built. How tragic. And this is the next generation of leadership because as Native women, we know that not only do we want to share leadership, but we want to make sure that a woman like me, I can just give direction the next round and I won't have to be rolling up and facing an Enbridge tank. Hmm. That'd be awesome. And so this is my granddaughters, a couple of them here and then a couple of nieces um, here, the next generation of leadership for the water protector movement and for the Anishinaabe movement. And our leadership not only fights bad ideas, you know, because to protect native women, you gotta fight fossil fuels pipelines, you gotta fight mining projects, you gotta fight bad policies by Canada, all those policies, but more than that, you gotta grow the seeds of hope. That's one of my favorite young women. This is Rowan White. Rowan White is a seed saver and a Mohawk woman. And in her short life, she has brought back to life so many seeds and so many seeds and so many foods and encouraged and nurtured us all. And you know, what she talks about is rematriation, rematriation, not repatriation, rematriation, the recovering and the restoration of the feminine, the restoration of the feminine in, in, in all facets of our public policy. Here she is returning a really cool old squash here to Taos Pueblo. I think this was last year or the year before. You know, and those squash seeds came out of a museum and, and uh, those squash were grown. Those squash were grown by Rowan and here they are being returned to a community. You know, what I know is, is that women are the highest rates of, of all of these, you know, deaths and murders with the highest rates of impact by these multinational corporations because we got to figure out how to feed our families. We got to feed how to protect our families and where we're going to get our water. You know, uh, in Canada, maybe Al Monaco and those other oil companies, they're going to grow their food with oil, but I don't grow mine with water. They're going to need some water. It's water's life. But, you know, in that also, we find that uh, these women are, are in this resistance and these women are growing this new economy. Because in the face of it, you know, while I sit here and I prepare to go face this corporation, I also am growing my foods. I planted my onions and I planted my potatoes. I started all my other 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 little guys, my, my basil, and I'm about to put my squash up. And this is some of our work for the new revolution, the new green revolution. That's what I call it. I'm a, I'm a hemp grower. I don't grow anything you could smoke. Seemed like a great thing to do, but that's not me. I'm the one, along with a lot of other ones, that's ready for the next economy. We could be talking about missing and murdered women for the rest of my life. I could be talking about new bad mining projects and new bad pipelines that Canada wants to bring to me because that's what Canada does. Or else we could just make the next transition. You know, Erin Dotty Roy, the uh, Indian writer, she talks about pandemic as portal. And she says, in the history of the world, pandemics have always forced societies to change. This one is no different. It's a, it's a portal between one world and the next. And the fact is, is that we had to change our lives for the last year. I didn't travel. I didn't fly around like I used to, be all important. I stayed home. I stayed home and grew food. That's what I did. I stayed home with a bunch of grandchildren, grew food and stayed home and made sure Amber didn't do anything dumb. But more than that, what we realized is, is that the new economy question she has is, what do you want to do? When you go through that portal, what do you want to bring with you? Do you want to bring your avarice, your hatred, your data banks, and your dirty skies and rivers, or you want to walk through clean? I say walk through clean. I say time for the new green revolution. And I like talking about that because Minnesota, the University of Minnesota specifically, was the birthplace of the green revolution. Mm -hmm. The birthplace of the green revolution. And you know what we need is a new green revolution. And that is hemp. That is hemp. And what I mean by that is, is that if the word canvas, if the word canvas comes from cannabis, you know, we could transform the textile economy, which has got all kind of fast fashion in it and all kinds of petroleum, and reduce a pretty huge carbon footprint. But more than that, we could transform the timber industry. Oh yeah, we could make paper out of hemp, hmm, four times as much fiber per acre as trees and it grows every year. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. And we could transform this economy to one that is based on hemp not on fossil fuels. That's what Canada needs. Canada needs addiction treatment. Y'all got an addiction issue. That's what fossil fuels are. They're super addictive. And Canada's economy is predicated on the endless, endless extraction of fossil fuels that the planet doesn't want and we certainly don't want. So what we need to do, Canada, is grow some hemp. 
the prairie provinces, that's your spot, some wind turbines and some hemp, that's what we want. That's the new green revolution because I wanna transform the materials economy with all my sisters and brothers so that we don't live with fossil fuels at the rate we do now. They say that about 120 years ago, we had a choice, no, it was 100 years ago between, we had, 100 years ago, we had a choice between a, a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. Let me say that one more time. We had a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy, and we made the wrong choice. That's it. You know, now is the opportunity for the new green revolution and the disruptive technologies that are going to change this relationship. Also changing the relationship on how we relate to women because we get to birth the new green revolution. We get to be doulas for it. Remember, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. You know, that is us. We are, we are seeds. We are seeds of the future in our bellies, in our hearts, in our dreams, and in our soil are the seeds for the next economy. And our women are strong. Our women are strong and our women are getting stronger. And we don't want to spend all our time fighting off stupid corporations. What we want to do is birth the next economy, birth the, the, the eighth fire, the just transition. And, um, you know, we want to invite y'all to join us. So for more information about our work, I just want to thank you for our time, but for more information about our work, uh, honorearth.org, www.honorearth.org. Miigwech. Thank you for your time. Miigwech. Good afternoon. The following panel contribution attempts to highlight key aspects of the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls of 2019 as it relates to my research and associated experiences with this heavy reality. Here is a screenshot of the final report online, um, and I've, I've offered you here the, um, the link um, to the report. Um, and I would like to you know, share with you some, um, some interesting facts um, about the report. Uh, it was released in 2000, June of 2019, after three years of work beginning in September 2016, uh, more than 2,380 people participated in the National Inquiry. That's 468 family members and survivors of violence shared their experiences and recommendations at 15 different community hearings throughout Canada. The brilliantly written research and evidence-based report is 1,200 pages long with a 121-page executive summary. And one of the findings in the report is the identification of MMIWG as a genocide. And I would like to take um, and give some historical context in support of this, okay? Um, this, 19, this, excuse me, this 1755 genocidal bounty called for the scalps of men and women um, where, where I come from. Um, and they were valued, this is, a, this is uh, Penobscot territory, um, and, and they were all along the Eastern seaboard, okay? And um, women's scalps were valued at half the compensation as a man. Um, and there's several things that we can, you know, glean from this, this colonial document, which by the way, has never been eradicated or apologized for. Uh, one, we can certainly see where the term scalping comes from, and this is stark evidence of how racism operates, as it is widely misunderstood that scalping comes from Indigenous peoples, when in fact scalping was derived from Europeans and bounties on Indigenous peoples and children, and their scalps, such as these, were prevalent, you know, as I said, all along the eastern seaboard, right up through New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. <clears throat> and as Mi'kmaq lawyer Pamela Palmeter identifies they represented the first state sanctioned cases of murdered and missing indigenous women. And the picture here um, is a photograph of my late great grandma who was the first generation to survive this bounty. Just share with you um, what I identify as uh, Wabanaki woman knowledge from late Passamaquoddy elder Mary Bassett who often reminded us that we are not supposed to be here but we are still here. She was reminding us as younger people of what we have survived, which is estimated as one of the largest acts of genocide the world has ever known. Before colonization, there were over 20 Wabanaki tribes. Today, there exist only five. And so roughly 97% um, 
population depletion um, has been experienced in North America of indigenous peoples. And this marked the first wave of, of genocidal policy against, against our people. So literally when late Mary, uh, when late elder Mary Bassett says we were not intended to be here, she literally means it. And similarly, she reminds us that we are still here, survivors, and that is something to covet and to protect. So intergenerational trauma is a heavy reality we face, and I invite you to think about the final report as a real opportunity to take a deeper look, to rethink how mainstream society often sees the issue of MMIWG as an indigenous people's problem and rooted in our deficits and inability to adapt and assimilate, which is completely inaccurate. My work calls for the critical need to engage with the issue of MMIWG in ways that address systemic oppression and what Indigenous scholar Brian Brayboy calls for as a tribal critical race analysis to examine the issue of MMIWG as not just an Indigenous people's issue, but instead the responsibility of the Canadian government and associated education, public education systems, including colleges and universities, who have ultimately benefited from the oppression of Indigenous peoples and continue to benefit from the ongoing land dispossession and breaking of treaties. Tribal critical race theory engages with both the racialization of indigenous peoples and the impacts of colonization. A tribal critical race analysis gives us thinking space to see that actually part of the deficiency is rooted in mainstream Canada's lack of understanding and education about these systems of oppression with embedded structural violence and miseducation or even apathy toward issues like MMIWG while also the expectation that we address systems of oppression and learn about them in those systems of oppression that were legislated like land dispossession via the Indian Act, Indian residential schools and the 60s scoop. Um, part of my research and my work um, is uh, mobilizing truth about indigenous girls and women um, and making every attempt as I can to humanize statistics because we are so much more than the statistics. The so, and so much more than the socioeconomic distress that we face on a daily basis. <clears throat> um, so in my attempt to raise awareness and mobilize truth, I would just you know, share some of these with you. As indigenous women and girls uh, and peoples, we are more impoverished than any other demographic group. We have the highest rates of socioeconomic distress of any racial or ethnic group in Canada or the United States. Almost half of Aboriginal women are living in poverty um, as I give this talk right now, there are Aboriginal women in Canada that do not have clean drinking water for their children and their families and um, don't have food to put on the table. We are the least likely to be homeowners in our homelands. We face the highest suicide rates of any population group in the country, up to seven times more likely to commit suicide than white people, more likely to attempt suicide than Native men However, uh, Native men are four times more likely to succeed in their suicide attempts. Um, and Native women in North America are ten, over 10 times more likely to be victims of violence than non-Native women. And because the majority of suicides are committed by young people, mothers and fathers, I'll say, grieving their children's untimely deaths are secondary victims. And as Dr. Korweber Pilwax, um, Métis elder, uh, Métis Cree elder um, scholar reminds us that as indigenous peoples, we are so much more than the genocide and the colonial oppression, uh, which is a really important principle underlying within the report. Uh, the report has a guiding principle that women are sacred. Um, and there is that ongoing reminder throughout the report that as native people, we are so much more than these statistics. Um, and that is needs to underpin um, much of what I say. And I think it is also a part of a tribal critical race analysis. Um, so the I'm going to read just a little bit directly from the report because it's an important, um, it's an important extrapolation from the report that I wanna highlight. And I quote, colonial violence, as well as racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia against Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual people has become embedded in everyday life, whether this is through interpersonal forms of violence, through institutions like the healthcare system and the justice system, or in the laws, policies, and structures of Canadian society. <clears throat> the result has been that many Indigenous peoples 
have grown up normalized to violence, while Canadian society shows an appalling apathy to addressing the issue. The National Inquiry into MMIWG finds that this amounts to genocide. And so I further note that the social acceptance of MMIWG marks the contemporary genocidal bounty on Native women's lives. We know that there are well over 2,000 MMIWG. If this were applied proportionately to the rest of the female population in Canada, that would exceed 40,000 non-Aboriginal women and girls, certainly a national crisis would be rightfully proclaimed. That would amount to the total student population here at the University of Alberta. And I assert, and certainly the report does, that Indigenous women deserve similar human rights. <clears throat> I also quote the report as highlighting that the thousands of truths shared before the National Inquiry reinforce the existence of acts of genocide against Indigenous women and girls and 2SL GBTQQIA people. The violence the National Inquiry heard about amounts to a race-based genocide of Indigenous peoples. This genocide has been empowered by colonial structures, evidenced notably by the Indian Act, the 60s Scoop, residential schools, and breaches of human indigenous rights leading directly to the current increased rates of violence, death and suicide in indigenous populations. <clears throat> the supplementary report offers legal analysis and discussion supporting this conclusion. And I highly recommend um, you looking, taking a read at the supplemental report. Again, it is brilliantly constructed and um, you know, certainly evidence and research based. Um, and that's a supplementary report breaking down and unpacking um, the genocidal nature of MMIWG. An example of the truths shared in the report are, I quote again, these fears are not unfounded. As expert witness Cassandra Churcher shared, the police and the criminal justice system exist in the lives of indigenous women, girls, and 2SLGBTQQIA people, not to provide safety and protection, but rather in a way that continues to traumatize, abuse, and control them. Lack of institutional will to change the criminal justice system manifests most clearly in the descriptions of police apathy in cases involving violence against Indigenous women and girls and 2SLGBTQQIA people that witnesses provided. This apathy often takes the form of stereotyping and victim blaming, such as when police describe missing loved ones as, quote, drunks, quote, runaways, out partying, quote, prostitutes unworthy to follow up. It's really important to understand that as I'm raising the significance of intergenerational trauma um, and its harsh reality and its need to be addressed in equal parts and maybe even, even moreover, um, institutional and systemic racism needs to be understood. And what one of the understandings um, that you know, I want to share is that indigenous peoples of North America are, are indeed the most heavily legislated against group than any other group. We have more laws and policies developed in order to deal with us as the quote Indian problem than any other group. Uh, and two examples of, of how the sort of racism is embedded in the law. So according to the Indian Act of 1876, it was a federal offense to practice indigenous ceremonies, including potlatch and sundance. Native people were barred from leaving reserves without permission and prohibited from wearing even ceremonial dress off reserve. And so in effect, indigenous knowledge systems were, um, were outlawed and, language, and associated languages within the school system, within, within the Indian, Indian residential school systems and the day schools, I, I would add. And that wasn't amended out of the Indian Act until 1951. So that was, you know, certainly over 75 years where those prohibitions were experienced. And so there's a legacy to those prohibitions as well, uh, which has caused a tremendous amount of um, dispossession, uh, attempt to dispossess a people of an identity, which is epistemicide, an intention to eradicate a people's <clears throat> way of knowing and being. So specific to gender inequality, the Indian Act of 1876 systematically dispossessed many Aboriginal women of their Indian status, in turn denying basic human rights and treaty rights, and in effect contributing to the increasing social reality of MMIWG. So exclusion from membership has meant the denial of treaty rights 
which have associated access to land and key services related to education and health. I want to get moved a little bit to the calls to justice. And I'm going to quote the section from the calls to justice. Although we have been mandated to provide recommendations, it must be understood that these recommendations, which we frame as calls for justice, are legal imperatives. They're not optional. The calls for justice arise from international and domestic human and indigenous rights laws, including the charter, the constitution, and the honor of the crown. As such, Canada has a legal obligation to fully implement these calls for justice and to ensure indigenous women, girls, and two, two spirit <coughs> LGBTQIA people live in dignity. <coughs> As the reports indicates, we demand a world within which First Nations, Inuit, and Métis families can raise their children with the same safety, security, and human rights that non-Indigenous families do, along with full respect for Indigenous, for the Indigenous and human rights of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis families. The 231 calls for justice are organized in three parts with 19 themes, and I've listed <clears throat> some of the themes, but the one that I want to highlight here in this particular context is the need for public education and greater public awareness of violence against Indigenous women and girls. And that is a solicitation to us as a regional comprehensive public university like the University of Alberta and the other U15 or U14 to address this particular um, call for justice as a legal imperative. We have a law obligation as public universities and colleges to raise awareness about MMIWG and give the public greater understanding and education on these matters. Hence, you know, this is why we're having this session, um, but I would also call for the need to have this in compulsory courses um, and, and made um, compulsory learning, okay? Teaching and learning. The majority of the calls for justice are aimed at governments and institutions, including universities. On an individual level, there are several actions Canadians can take, including, but of course not limited to, denounce, of course, and speak out against violence <clears throat> against Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit LGBTQIA people. Decolonize by learning the true history of Canada and Indigenous history in your local area. Develop knowledge and read the final report. Um, and it's as simple as that. Um, Using what you've learned and some of the resources suggested, become a strong ally. Help hold all governments accountable to act on the calls for justice. Write your MLA, ask what's being done, see what's happening in the Alberta curriculum. Uh, we know that the majority of Albertans are not satisfied with the, with the new curriculum that is being proposed. <clears throat> um, and you have the opportunity to write to your MLA about that. Um, as I, you know, as I also reflect on Wabanaki woman knowledge and relay all of this information to you, I want to share with you some thinking um, that Sipsis, late Sipsis, a Penobscot elder and scholar, um, shared with us as younger women. Um, you know, and it's something to think about. You know, as you consider, you know, what what we're taking up, you know, in this event today in this session. As Native people, we have to think about white people every day, and white people don't ever have to think about us. Um, and that's a, a stunning realization. Um, and it's part of something that I am calling for in my work called anti-racist conviction. There were over a thousand people that were a part of this report. Um, it's a 1200 page document. There were over 400 families that testified. And there are uh, well over, you know, a thousand truths that are identified in that report. And part of anti-racist conviction will be taking up you know, particularly if you are an instructor um, uh, or a, a teacher and you have students, um, if you are an adult educator, um, to take up those truths and mobilize them um, because it was the burden of those families that came forward uh, to share their realities, similar, like, similar to the Indian residential school survivors that shared their stories, their gripping and re-traumatizing stories and now it's up to us as a Canadian public and within universities to lift the burden of telling those stories off the victims and their families and mobilizing the truth about them. And you know that is a space of engagement with anti-racist conviction that, um, that my work is calling for. And at the same time, and what I often tell you know, university students that I work with, 
I quote Barbara Thomas's article, remember that you're not responsible for the wrongs committed before you were born, but you can't escape the legacy of those wrongs. You need to understand some history in order to understand your current position in the world and other people's perceptions of you. And you are responsible for what you do now. So anti-racist conviction, conviction calls for the taking up of you know, the difficult knowledge. And what Britzman identifies is that there's often a tension between teaching the lovely knowledge versus the difficult knowledge. And, you know, teaching the difficult knowledge is teaching, you know, what I've, you know, much of what I've been mobilizing here and those truths that are embedded in the report. <clears throat> Otherwise, as Toku identifies, trying to change the world without changing our minds is like trying to clean the dirty face in the mirror by scrubbing the glass alone. Um, and I also quote um, late Rainey Atian, who you know calls for the need to take up the cleaning products and teach about the oppression and the colonial violence. Um, and she says, white people think we're like a convenience store. They like to come in and buy the candy and the M&Ms of our culture and spirituality and leave behind all the cleaning products like the oppression, the colonialism and the racism. So finally, uh, where, I'm, where I'm landing here is Jibunog, which is Red Hope and its relationship to political will. Um, such change that I'm talking about will require the political will of non-Indigenous peoples to meaningfully engage with the more difficult task of taking up Atian's cleaning products to address colonial oppression and racism. Also critical is the acknowledgement of Red Hope that Indigenous peoples will continue to be the leaders in asserting our rights in order to affect social and political change. And Red Hope Jibunog offers a bright horizon, reminding us that epistemicide and genocide are not complete. And with that, um, you know, I thank you for listening to my session and um, and and for your engagement, you know, with this material. And hopefully, you know, similar to what the other panelists are calling for, um, you are able to find ways to take action to mobilize, um, you know, better understandings about the issue and really go in depth with the report. Thank you very much. I didn't even go to any of this. Here are my references. <laughs> there is Jibunog, uh, my son. And here are the references to the presentation. Dr. Wilson is not able to join us today. And in lieu of her panel presentation, we will show the trailer to Smudge Don't Judge, a video project she's contributed to with No More Silence, a collaboration with Maggie's Toronto Sex Worker Action Project aimed to support Indigenous community. Looking at the research that has been done about homophobia and transphobia on Indigenous people, um, it is, it's very systemic and it is very historic where you had like early uh, two-spirited people who were um, um, met with initial violence, sometimes were the first societies that were erased from Indigenous cultures and societies. Another level of violence that's enacted on the bodies of two-spirit and trans-Indigenous people happens when they go to seek help. Um, from a mainstream or a, even an Indigenous organization is that one, they're not believed often, they're questioned, their uh, behaviors are questioned, their identity is questioned, their gender is questioned. And I'll be blaming Two-Spirit people for their own lives, being homeless, underemployed, doing sex work or you know or just being two-spirited that it's our fault for it's our own fault for the the violence that we experience any kind of service provider should be aware that they may be the only person that that person um, is coming to or that or will have contact to so it's a pivotal and powerful position to be in if someone comes to you and shares that they have experienced violence one of the most effective strategies for um, supporting trans and two-spirit or gender non-binary people is to suspend your judgment around their, their bodies, around their actions, around their behaviors, around their lifestyles. It's important to take a harm reduction approach. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to be part of your annual conference. I want to start by acknowledging the presence of elders and knowledge keepers who may be part of the audience today. 
I'm joining you today as a Métis woman and as an Indigenous lawyer whose practice has predominantly involved working with and for First Nations and Métis governments, individuals, organizations, and advocacy groups. With the convenience of online gatherings such as this being possible, uh, we never know where we're at. So I just wanted to say that I'm joining everybody today from Alberta. <clears throat> Just a bit of background about myself. I was born and raised in remote Northern communities in Alberta, and I remain connected to those communities through kinship ties. My mother is Cree Métis, and my father is of European descent. My parents divorced when I was quite young. My brother and I stayed with my mother. We were very close with our maternal side of the family, and in particular, our grandparents who lived a very traditional Métis life living off the land. For almost a decade of my practice as a lawyer, I was directly involved with former residential school students who went through Indian residential schools. When they were seeking resolution of their civil claims against Canada for abuse, physical and sexual abuse that they endured in those government run institutions. That was a life changing experience for me. And it provided me with great insight into the history of the impact of education policy on Indigenous peoples in this country. The reason I give this background is because much of what I have to say today has to do with my own lived experience as an Indigenous person, as well as my professional expertise and experience as an Indigenous lawyer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now I'm not an educator by profession. And so when I was invited to speak at this very important national gathering, I was a bit intimidated, I have to say. And the lawyer in me prompted me to do a bit of research on the CSSE to determine how what I had to say and how my, my life experience would fit in. My research, again, the lawyer in me, determined that the CSSE is described as the major national voice for those who create educational knowledge, prepare teachers and educational leaders, and apply research in the schools, classrooms, and institutions of Canada. That's a big job, an important one. This particular series of discussions in this gathering, I am told, seeks to mobilize action for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in the academy with the intention to impact the education system and society at large. And so that is where I found the connection between what I do and what the CSSE is doing, because I do indeed have a lot to say and have observed firsthand how the national tragedy of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls continues to impact many of us Indigenous people in society today. And I see education as a key driver in stopping that violence. <clears throat> now, before I begin talking about this very important subject matter, I want to acknowledge and honor the courage, the strength and the resilience of Indigenous women whose lives have been impacted by violence. In all of my work, I am deeply grateful for their continued guidance and trust in those of us who are working within the system to reclaim our rightful power and place. I am the president of the Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women, which is a nonprofit advocacy organization in Alberta. We have significant province wide membership of over 450 people, women. This organization has been extensively involved in advocating for Indigenous women. I mention it because IAAW, that's the acronym, had party standing in the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And so we had opportunity, and I was a counsel for the Institute, to attend hearings and to hear firsthand evidence of witnesses who appeared before the commission. Since the inquiry, IAAW has engaged with over 200 women here in Alberta specifically on the issues that were considered in the inquiry and specifically on the 231 calls to action. So let's talk a little bit about the National Inquiry now. The National Inquiry was the first in Canadian history to be vested with legal powers and obligations from all of the public inquiry acts across the country. This is significant. It means that the commissioners were vested with the legal power to generally compel production of docu documents, such as from the police and government, 
and to compel witnesses to testify in every region of the country. And there were hearings held throughout the country nationally. Commissioners heard evidence on practices and policies that have served to contribute to, or alternatively to reduce, the vulnerability of Indigenous women and girls who experience violence. They examined the systemic causes and processes contributing to the high incidence of violence experienced by Indigenous women, girls, women and girls, excuse me, and the disproportionately high rate by which they are lost. Through the hearing process, commis commissioners considered various forms of evidence. They heard primarily and first importantly, firsthand from family members of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. They heard from government representatives, the police, advocacy organizations, service providers, knowledge keepers, and experts, and so on. Cumulatively, they accepted evidence which enabled them to make their findings of fact, which culminated in support the 231 calls for justice. <clears throat> Let's talk about the calls for justice. These are directed at governments, institutions, so social service providers, industries, and all Canadians, frankly, in order to address this national tragedy. Issues covered in the calls include police practices and relationships, child welfare, constitutional issues, the criminal justice system, death investigation processes, education and education systems, health and health services, the impact of colonialization on violence against Indigenous women and girls and the media. Last, but certainly not least, we cannot overlook the important finding by the inquiry of cultural genocide in this country. Now on the one year anniversary of the final report, which was June, 2020, Prime Minister Trudeau reiterated publicly that quote, ending this national tragedy through the co-development and implementation of a distinction based national action plan is an urgent priority for our government and requires ongoing work for all partners." End quote. It has been almost two years since that final report was issued. Contained within the thousands of pages are calls for transformative legal and social change to resolve the crisis that has devastated, and I remind you, continues to devastate Indigenous communities across this country. To date, no action plan yet, which was characterized as an urgent priority, has been formulated. I cannot emphasize the constant message that those of us working with families and communities here is that the surviving families want justice. These calls to action are not soft policy. They are legal imperatives. But they are rendered meaningless so long as there continues to be an absence of substantive positive change in the lives of Indigenous women, children, families, and communities. I cannot remind you enough that the violence that Indigenous women experience is not history. Again, those of us working in the area of ad advocacy here on a regular basis, I guarantee you weekly, stories about murder, rape, systemic violence, removal of children from families, human trafficking, in any given week, we hear about a woman gone missing, who's beaten, who has been killed or abused. Addressing the reality of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is not simply a matter of government policy. It is a matter of survival. I did say early on that I see education as a key driver in stopping the violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada. This is because in my opinion, true change requires hard work, commitment, and most of all, a willingness to change how we think and do things, think about and do things. And I think that it is through higher learning that that paradigm shift may be possible. We hear governments espouse commitment to addressing the continual loss of Indigenous women and girls to violence. We cannot justify this reality that I've spoken about and which we hear and know happens on a daily basis while we sit in our boardrooms or our classrooms discussing relationships and reconciliation. Frankly, we are tired of the reconciliation rhetoric. The time for real change is now. Thank you.
is that concept of the sacred self. And so this information was shared with me when I myself became a woman. And um, I was able to articulate that initially in the work, but since I have um, been in this position as the president of the Muscogee's Cultural College in, in my community, I've held this position now for four years, I've been able now to take that work and extend it further into what um, I'm wanting to share with you all today. And so that model is, um, is based on uh, Muscogee's Cree epistemology. And it's still practiced and it's still available for us today. And so that idea of the child self, the sacred self, the warrior self, and the wise self, all of those four parts of myself are within me. And I knew that growing up, that idea that women are, are sacred, they're life givers, they're given that ability, that responsibility um, to create and partake in that beautiful gift, you know, but to know that our children are loaned to us, that the creator um, uh, loans these children to us. And there's a lot of teachings that I've been able to learn, even in my role here as, as an administrator, that I am continuing to learn about the foundations of um, the Cree epistemology. Even when you take a look at that word, awasis, you know, our resident elder, Jerry Saddleback, tells this beautiful story about the, um, the breakdown, the um, breakdown of that Cree word, awasis, and how the, the child is, uh, comes from the sky and how there's connections to even our language and the syllabics. So our syllabics, you know, is embedded uh, within the creation story. And so I'm just bringing that concept forward uh, for you all to consider. And I'm thankful that I've been able to work with um, many gifted elders in the community. And I'm so um, humbled that they openly share this information with us um, as a, re a reminder that we are these, um, we do hold these different parts of ourselves and sacredness is um, one of those parts. So I wanted to speak a little bit about that. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is that um, in February 2020, right before COVID hit in the community, we had an opportunity at the uh, Muscogee's Cultural College to host the National Indigenous Women's um, Gathering. And so we um, successfully launched that program and we celebrated um, Indigenous womanhood. And we had um, uh, Marion Bueller come and give the keynote speak, uh, speech at the uh, gathering. And what we did at the gathering was we implemented and utilized the frame that we were able to, to develop here in Muscogee's over 10 years. And so this frame, we just implemented the frame and we offered this uh, beautiful experience, this gathering. And um, we have, uh, I'm sharing with you some photos of the event where we came together to uh, celebrate our uh, sacredness, to celebrate our identity and to recognize and appreciate our own worth and our own val and our own values within our communities and uh, outside of the community. But knowing full well that we hold a responsibility to teach our young girls how to be safe. And to me, that's, an, uh, that's a troubling concept. However, it's my reality. I have two daughters and knowing that there's this um, threat that they as um, Aboriginal girls will have to experience and endure in their lives, that they need to be aware of the impending violences and dangerous um, situations that they can get themselves into. Um, I have a responsibility as a mother to protect them. And um, I ask, what are others doing? And what can others do to help us 
protect our daughters. Um, so that's a question, you know, that needs to be uh, taken up in different organization, as do the, the, the calls to justice, the many calls to justice that have been identified here. And then last thing that I wanted to share with you is um, uh, I wanted to honor my late mother, uh, Nancy Yellowbird. She was a leader in our community. Uh, she passed away uh, on the ninth year of her term in council here in the Samson community. And she was one of the um, um, pioneers regarding entrepreneurship within the community. Uh, she worked very hard. She was the director of the health center. She established the daycare system here. Uh, she was one of the first psychiatric nurses. She obtained her, her GED after uh, she went to grade eight because uh, that was the highest uh, level of education that she could obtain in the uh, Indian residential school, you know, and she gave birth to me when she was 16, 17 years old. And so I honor her today and I bring her, her name to this group because it's women like her that have led the path and will continue to lead the path for us today and for the future. Hi, hi. Kakyo Scott now. Exmaga. Dance, Lana Whiskey Jack Nitsigason, Onyx Kaponiko Tsenia, Egwa. My belly button is connected to generations of Nehio Squarewak from this land to Treaty 6 Sad Lake Cree Nation, who have been affected by systemic colonial violence from the Indian Act to Indian Residential School. I speak from an accumulation of inherent ancestral and umbilical experiences of trauma and wisdom. I speak from a heart center of intergenerational resilience with a profound kinship love to the land language and kakyao nawagamaganak to all my relations, including all those treaty relatives who continue prayerful steps in restoring good relations to the historical abuses of power. I speak with great responsibility and humility as an Esquel, mother, grandmother, daughter, and granddaughter, wife, activist, researcher, educator, and scholar, to those who came before me and to those who continue to walk the paths created by generations of Iseniwak, Oma, Oti, Aski, humans of this earth. In reflecting on the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, I think about the Mi'kmaq elder who spoke about the importance of how our ancestors preserved identity and knowledge through artistic expressions. I also think about my mentor, Alex Janvier, who said, if you want to paint something ugly, make it beautiful. So I consider my work, um, I consider myself as a skull artist, a scholar and artist. I'm an arts-based practice a uh, scholar as well as an arts-based practice researcher. In the, create, in the act of creating and being a creator, being the author of my own story, I am confronting, I'm often confronting trauma to transcend it into something that's sacred and powerful. When I create, I am developing new neural pathways to help reconstruct and redefine my experiences and that makes sense to my Nehia worldview and language, not just through words, but through visual literacy and wisdom. So art is my way of ceremony, and it was an important recommendation in the report that personal healing uh, is connected through ceremony and traditional knowledge. And art is also a way of, of turn, transcending a lot of the inherent trauma into inherent wisdom. And it's through my arts practices that I've learned to develop the language to speak um, my own story uh, through words. And art became one of my ways of, of developing my own rites of passage, of confronting trauma to transcending it. And it's an important way of creating our own methods of moving through the different stages of life from 
looking at our childhood and our into adulthood and and developing helping us to become elders in the in the the report is quote this is quoted of finding healing and ultimately happiness through personal healing was deeply personal experience for many witnesses the ability to start this journey depended in many cases on the kinds of support available and in many examples people look first to ceremony and traditional knowledge to find the pathways to healing so art helped to develop the language and the story in order that I was able to carry for myself. But also, when you're able to carry your own story in a kind, loving way, um, then you're able to help others to carry their stories. And so artists became this ceremonial way of, of telling these stories of, of resilience. And one of the um, important part as well is including our families with this work. And so this uh, is a painting on exploring the 13 moons. This is represents May, the leaf budding moon. And it represents um, diverse genders of, of coming into their own being. And one of the uh, uh, recommendation is the importance of being able to engage in ceremony and cultural practices was cited from Métis First Nations, Inuit, and 2S LGBTQIA perspectives as an important way to heal. One of the way, first places of healing is being on the land, land-based healing for that is inclusive of all our diverse genders. Um, it's also one of the most important ceremonies that we've been disconnected from has been our rites of passage, uh, which first nurtures with our spirit's growth through, um, through receiving our spirit names uh, that reflect so much of our roles and responsibilities as being humans of this land. So this art reflects my role of being a mother of an the, the an all-gendered being my transgendered son and it reflects the the importance of rites of passage ceremony of starting in that ceremony of nurturing this his spirit and honoring him with his spirit name and that reflects his roles and responsibilities and and giving him that space of of being uh being a scalp us for other ceremonies so it's and so one of the re important recommendation is being able to engage in ceremony and cultural practices from uh, that is inclusive to all genders to 2s LGBTQIA. It's an important way of beginning those the healing practices uh, from our own peoples, from our own kinship and communities and languages and lands connected to the lands. And so art is also an important way of also reflecting my own role as a mother and how we need to, you know, in, in creating that visual reminder of honoring the sacred. When you become a mother, you are creating a grandmother. You're creating a sister and you're creating aunties and other kinship relatives. And it's so important, you know, that uh, we are co-mothering with our little mo the little mothers of our children, that we are co-mothering with the grandmothers of our children, and 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 our grandfathers and and all of our other relatives, and nurturing our families and and also to to govern our nations together, as what in Cree, you know, we we speak about that mama we of working together, of helping one another. When I introduce myself uh, at the beginning of this presentation, uh, Nitsiga son Otsiniya, both the root words, the root word of both of that, those sentences of my name is and I am from is Nitsi or Utsi, my belly buttoned. And so we, as, as Nehiawak, as Cree people, we are a matrilineal people because we introduce ourselves through our mother's, our mother's lineage, our, our matriarchs. And we're, when we're speaking it in our language, uh, we're also uh, we're acknowledging not 
only our belly button connections to the wombs we come from, but also those to our, that come from our wombs and the importance of, of um, honoring that and reminding ourselves uh, through the language of, of visual language as well as through our words of our sacred roles as mothers and the importance of um, that the, the mother role is supported by the grandmothers and the aunties. This, in this work, this is speaking to the Canada state, which in the recommendation of, um, that speaks about creating time and space for relationships based on respect as human beings and supporting and embracing the differences with kindness, love and respect, learning about indigenous principles of relationships specific to nations and communities in our local areas. And then not only learning about it, but putting those, the, those learnings into practice in all of our relationships with, with Indigenous people. And so I'm from Treaty 6, and we have our natural laws of truth, kindness, sharing, and strength, and prayer. And, and each of this is, we have, um, is, is, is our principles of living a good life, a meo bamatsawin. We have no word for art in Cree because art is, is creation, it is ceremony, it's a spiritual relationship. And so we live life as art. You know, we have principles of walking and talking and being in beauty uh, with one another. And so art is this um, important language of being able to connect to one another and sharing these stories and reminding each other of these principles of living a good life of um, of not only with ourselves but with the living land and all of our relationships are you know the kakianawagamaganak the visual reminders within my art is about um, you know, about walking and talking and, and being in beauty as an Esquel, as in, in all those roles that Esquel walk have within their, within their communities. It's about that mama we of working together, of coming together um, in order to help one another, to help lift one another in reminding us of our, of our sacred roles and responsibilities as Esquel walk. So I thank you kindly. Hi, hi, Mr. Hit, Nwagamaganuk. I am so grateful to be in, in a part of this panel of incredible human beings. Hi, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Harp. Um, I am from uh, Edmonton, Alberta. My community is Fort Mackay First Nations. And I'm here to talk to you as a grassroots advocate when it comes to murdered, missing and exploited Indigenous peoples of Canada um, as a survivor. And, uh, you know, having my voice have the reach that it has. Um, I have information from the ground. I've been with the people for a long time. And uh, once I started, you know, to go to school as a young child, um, no one really taught me or, or let me know who I was. My mother was so traumatized from residential school and all of the, you know, genocide and, and um, you know, oppression uh, back, back then uh, that she suffered through and all the my family has suffered through. Um, you know, you, you learn things, um, but she never taught us about uh, who we were as Indigenous people and as a child. So I went to school thinking I would find some history, I would find some truths. And unfortunately, I, I didn't receive that. And I didn't understand what was going on. And once I was older, I found out the truth of what happened to us since, you know, times of being 
um, of being still oppressed. Everyone thinks the, these things have happened in, oh, a long, long time ago, but all of these are embedded in every modern structure and system that we all deal with every day. It's unfortunate you just don't see it, but Indigenous people live it. All that trauma bleeds into our every day of living. And because we had survived all those things and we're still surviving here today. Um, it's, it's sad that we're the lowest population here in Canada, but we are the highest rate of everything awful. And that's not where I, our identity lies in the dark. And you don't see a lot of these things because they're done in the dark. And it's unfortunate that we don't get a lot of truth today, do we? There's a lot of misinformation out there. So you, you really gotta, you know, have lived it to really speak to it. So that's where I came and I started to share my story about survival, um, everything that uh, I've been through. But the trauma stopped at me, biggest success of my life, because I dealt with my rooted pain. I found out my true history. And I finally understood as an adult what happened to me and my people. And once I started to share my story and other people could connect to that, and I was on my path, that, that was it. I was with the people for many years here. And... Um, yeah, uh, 2019, I went to 32 Indigenous communities in, in, in that year, and uh, I saw a lot of suffering, and I saw some resilience, okay? Because that's not our identity, is not in the dark. Our identity is, is in the light as well. And we are getting educated, and we are getting powerful, and unfortunately, um, the, the modern oppression is there because of the agenda to make sure that we don't get well or powerful or, or speak our language or do our ceremonies that were outlawed long ago because of land and water and the value of that to others. One of the fastest growing crimes in right now is human trafficking. It's at the forefront of nothing. It's unfortunate. If you knew the truth, you'd be in shock. You'd be alarmed. So we have a, a national website called AboriginalAlert.ca, which we are collecting our missing Indigenous peoples on nationally. So you can see the shock. And when we did the national inquiry, we said it was genocide. We meant it was genocide. And so we want that to be honored and we want the 231 calls to be honored as well. But you need information on safety. You need information on these crimes. And there's many lived experience people that can give that to you. We have to do this at a grassroots level to make sure that it's done properly. Um, you know, it's, um, it's not gonna get done any other way. And uh, survivors and lived experience people are key to that. I think early intervention of education in truth with our, you know, indigenous peoples of this country is, is very, very key and preventative. Um, as a very traumatized child, I lived a very, very um, hard life. And maybe... That could have been different for me had I had those gifts of truth, had I had that sense of identity, had they had it taught me uh, more about my language and ceremony, you know, for we are on these lands. Let's honor that and let's elevate the truth. Let's elevate the Indigenous people. I know for a fact that the world is watching, the world is caring. 
uh, I received this beautiful gift from Great Britain with my mother's name on it. And um, she was murdered in 1999, Ruby Ann McDonald. And someone from Great Britain sent this to me. So I know the world is listening. I know the world cares. We just need you to, to do the same and educate properly in truth in the history of the land that you're on and the people that you're with. And I need you to remember, we all have a raging fire within us. Just share your warmth and watch everything beautiful in the world thrive. Marcy Cho. I'm going to read you a poem I wrote about an experience I had as a 17 year old girl. I was freshly graduated from high school, poised to enter the University of Alberta in the fall as an undergraduate student. I spent that summer working for a nonprofit Indigenous organization as a peer mentor. I was on my way to a meeting in Spruce Grove, traveling from Edmonton down Highway 16A, when my rattle trap of a car broke down on the side of the road. This particular highway is a notorious thoroughfare among Indigenous people in this area. It was the summer of Oka, and the tense atmosphere in the city of Edmonton as a young Native girl was one I never wished to revisit. What happened next is a memory that has been an integral part of my own story through the years, though it's one that I haven't shared widely or often. It's a story that honors all of those sisters who have told me of similar experiences in their own lives. And it is in its own way, an honor song for those of my sisters who are not with us to tell their own stories. It's called Pretty Little Indian Girl. <clears throat> I can't tell you what he looked like, like someone's white grandpa, that's all I remember. When his hand slipped to my knee and squeezed, I felt the bottom drop out of my world. Why waste time going to school when you're such a pretty little Indian girl? There are many men like me who would like your company and would pay well for it. You could travel all over and have a good life. Why waste your time, pretty little Indian girl? This is my truth. The truth of an encounter that still haunts me 30 years later. The truth of a trusting, open-hearted 17-year-old girl accepting a ride from a stranger. Broken down on the side of the highway from Edmonton to Spruce Grove. Broken down from a small encounter with a man who just wanted a pretty little Indian girl. What happened to you, Munya Grandpa, when I jumped out of the car and ran? What happened when I ran to safety? ran from the menace that was poised to define my life as a pretty little Indian girl. What happened after your attempt at claiming my body like so many before? I was never Terra Nullius. Why didn't you know that? Did you find another pretty little Indian girl? What did you do to her, to them? My sisters, my mothers, my aunties, my daughters. I don't really care what happened to you. The constant threat of your existence makes mine precarious and foreboding. You don't matter. I care about what happened to them. I wonder if your special form of colonial violence was extended to my kin. I wonder if they were able to get away like I did. How many other pretty little Indian girls did you traumatize? How many other pretty little Indian girls got away? How many other pretty little Indian girls didn't? You don't matter. I do. They do. Hi, hi.
got this feeling I can't explain Don't know what to do with my troubles and my pain So I roll it up I make that choice To feel that happiness and project upon my voice lost in a feeling lost in a thought trying to contemplate the only choices that you got and hey what can you do Don't know how to handle this feeling inside you. And hey, what can you say when you're so lost in your own head, wondering how to change your day? Just roll it up. Just wait and see Forget that misery And today Today will be great Got this feeling that I can't explain Don't know what to do with my chosen So much love gone to another place. So much love found here, but nothing could replace. Just roll it up, just wait and see. Forget that. Thank you for your virtual participation in this session. We hope that we have raised some awareness for you on these matters, and I hope you find ways to take action. We have addressed the deep and troubling connection between natural resource extraction to the ongoing issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The findings of the report have been highlighted and unpacked with attention to the genocidal nature of missing and murdered Indigenous girls, women and girls. The underlying principle that guided the report that women are sacred has been showcased in our panel in ways that are lived personally and within our respective communities. We have also shared with you the critical importance of two-spirit, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual community as a priority in addressing the issue, the, as a priority in addressing the issue of MMIWG. The session has also offered some invaluable life stories and experiences that we hope impacts and mobilizes change, offering creative and artistic expression of this harsh reality. As Elder <coughs> Ekde prayed for, and I quote, we don't give up, that we continue to work hard and support one another as we find solutions so this will stop. I implore you to identify ways to mobilize the truth of the historical and contemporary systems that create these harsh realities so that the responsibility shifts from the burden that the victims and families carry in generously sharing their stories to the public universities and colleges to share these stories in partial fulfillment 
of the legal imperative stated as one of the calls for justice, and I quote, there is great need for public education and greater public awareness of violence against Indigenous women and girls. It's important that this burden carried by the victims and families sharing be shifted to the spotlight to spotlight the systems of dominance and oppression, both historical and contemporarily, some of which are naturalized to us as quote normal, so that we understand how those of us implicated and those who benefit from these dominant and interlocking systems can comprehend our implication in the conditions that bear down so violently on MMIWG. This will mean a much broader taking up of the responsibility. I encourage you to read the report as a first action step toward this end and educate yourself on how to effectively teach about this through an anti-racist and anti-oppression lens. The following slides <clears throat> are some of the resources identified in the panel in the following, in, excuse me, including the final report. The No More Silence resources. And there's an excellent video that offers invaluable information on what to do if your loved one goes missing. So in closing, I wish each of you the best of health as we continue to face this pandemic. Wuli wuni, ishnish, hi hi, exomagan, tahoe. Thank you. This closes our session. Remember